Hello and welcome to our PCS Grades weekly webinar. Today we are talking about PCS Moves, just tell me what to do with our guests from the moving industry. So we're going to meet Tim Hellenthal, the chairman and CEO of National Van Lines, and Sherelle Bird III, a driver, in just a moment. I'm Lizanne Lightfoot. I'm the senior content editor here at PCS Grades. I'm a military spouse mom of five kids. We have moved six times. We've lived in six different houses as a military family. And I think we moved ourselves three of those times. So this is my wonderful co-host, Tessa Robinson. Hi, I'm Tessa Robinson. I'm a guest content creator for PCS Greats, mom of two, fifth grade girls basketball coach, and lover of all things moving and helping people move. I'm so excited to have our experts here today. Tim and Sherelle, first question, kind of a softball. Tim, I'm going to start with you. Tell us about yourself and your experience with the moving industry. So um, I've been working with National Van Lines for 27 years. I spent the first 18 years of my career doing exclusively on our military side of the company, handling uh, PCS moves, and that's called National Forward and Company. Um, so I didn't know I was, we were kind of talking before we got on here about uh, knowing about the moving business. I didn't know about it until I got into it. And uh, it's really been great. There's a lot of great people in this, in this industry. And it's really fun to get to, uh, to work with all sorts of different people from all over the world that we move on a daily basis. Awesome. We're so excited to have you here. And Sherelle, tell us about you. I drive for United Van Lines. I've been with them since 97 and I started in 94, uh, just uh, looking for something to do in the summer, uh, looking to see the country. And I'm a first generation mover. I saw an ad in the paper, get your free CDL. And I signed up and next month's 28 years. So I, I love the job. And Sherelle, you shared with us before that you were uh, working at Burger King, getting your yes. English major <laughs> <laughs> and decided to be to be a driver, which is incredible. Some might say that's a whopper of a story. I, hey, I've yeah. never thought. Wow. <laughs> nice little tie in there. I've been thinking about that for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we keep Tessa around. I'm going to start using that. I'm, I'm going to steal that line. I like that. <laughs> You're that's, welcome uh, to it. That's a cheesy line. It's a whopper with cheese. <laughs> oh, double. I love it. <laughs> well, I just want to thank all of our viewers who are tuning in now. Um, I see we have Ernie, who is another driver who's been a former guest on the show. So greetings to Ernie and to everyone who's tuning in. Tell us which military base you're stationed at right now. If you have an upcoming PCS move, we want to hear all of your questions because this is going to be a webinar full of questions and answers straight from the moving companies. So I'm so excited to get started with them. But I need to remind our viewers that we are giving away two prizes today at the end of the show. We have two stressless PCS kits, and that is everything that you need to get organized for your PCS to have color-coded tags that you can put on your boxes, color-coded door handles or door uh, hangers that you can put on those doors. And it just really smooths the communication between you and the moving company. So I'm excited to give those away at the end of the show. You know how this works. Everyone who is commenting, asking questions, sharing feedback throughout today's webinar, you will be entered into a drawing and we will do that live at the end of the show. It's so that's part of it. For a it's my favorite part and two really great prizes today. I think it's probably a better approach than my typical wing it approach to moving. Um, so Tim, speaking of winging it, how should military families prepare for a PCS move? Well, I think, uh, you know, talking about this webinar and about, you know, just tell me what to do, kind of this idea that there's some, you know, easy button to make your relocation you know, stress-free. I don't think it exists. I think that's, uh, you know, it's a unicorn. I think the best mm -hmm. thing that you can do is prepare. And that means watch webinars like this, uh, get a good moving checklist. I know you guys have one, a lot of the movers do. Um, the other thing you can do for yourself is to book early, you know, because there's a limited capacity in the moving industry. And when we hit peak season during summer, when the kids are out of school, there's more people moving than there are trucks. And so the sooner that you can reserve your spot, uh, the more likely you're gonna be able to have a good experience with the mover. So if you're going um, 
through the base to get a mover like us, uh, you know, selected to to come in and do your pack out and, and transport you and deliver you. Uh, get in there early because capacity, you know, the seats on the on the plane are getting used up right now, getting booked up right now. And if you're going to do your own move or go outside and try to hire your own mover, make sure and do that early too. Um, make sure that you're not getting a broker. Um, you know, there's there's websites, FMCSA, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, has a um, place where you can look up movers, make sure they really have trucks. Just don't get suckered in with a broker. There's a lot of people on the internet that are going to promise you uh, real cheap moves. And that's one of our concerns when kind of us uh, movers that have been vetted by the DOD run out of capacity. Uh, it doesn't leave a lot of room for folks in the military. You know, where are you going to go? Where are you going to find your move? So just be extra cautious. That's one of our big concerns, making sure uh, you get booked early. That's going to help you get a good move. For sure. And we've addressed that question on a previous webinar, too. So if you guys are just tuning in, you can go back and watch that one about how to hire your own movers. Now, that's for military families who are doing a PPM or what used to be known as a Diddy move. But today we're focusing mostly on those military movers who are coming to your house through the DOD regulations and packing up everything that you own. So Tim, you, you emphasize the importance of preparing early and booking as soon as possible. And I know that you've been working alongside Transcom with those regulations and trying to get everything smoothed out for military families. But what can you tell us about that initial moving survey? How does that work and what should we expect? Well, I think, you know, the initial survey is probably, you know, maybe the most important part of the move. And I think for you as, a, as our customer, uh, you know, what we're going to do is, you know, there's requirements on when we have to come out and do your survey. And those kind of keep changing, um, I guess, to start with is when you get that first email that says your shipment has been awarded to a transportation service provider, mm -hmm. um, give them a call. Right. So I know our process is we'll send you an email and say, here's all your contact. Here's everybody you need to contact within our company. This is your single point of contact. Right. So you always know who to call. Not every company works the way we do, but make sure you establish that line of communication. Then you can talk to them about the pre-move survey. Pre-move survey is when one of our people will either come out to your home or we can also do it virtually based on what your requirements are and what your what your preferences are. Um, but make sure that when that person comes out to your home, we're going to come out and try to get an assessment of what packing requirements you're going to have, if there are any special services that need to be approved by the government. Uh, maybe you have some unusual item that might need created uh, that requires special approval. Uh, when that pre-move surveyor comes in there too, you know, show them what's important to you. You know, these folks are going into a lot of homes. You know, they see a lot of plastic totes and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they kind of become... Um, you know, immune to them and say, you know, just think of them as plastic totes. Maybe that's something that's really important to you. Make sure and show them those important things, those things that are really uh, valuable to you. Um, and then don't forget to show them or think about what might be up in your attic that needs to be made accessible, what's in the basement, what's in the garage. Don't forget all those different kinds of things um, because that's going to have, that's going to help make sure that you don't go overweight. And that's a big, mm -hmm. I know that's a big issue and bless you, by the way definitely is. Thank you. And you guys are getting some love in the comments. I think we've been putting some up on the screen. It looks like Sherelle, you got a, a fan out there. I know. Hey, I have to say, if Ernie Pena thinks you're the real deal, I mean, oh, we're wow. about, you know, one minute away from offering Ernie a, his oh. own reality show. He's a celebrity. So maybe the two of you can be on together. So that would be amazing. Strong words of endorsement. <laughs> Tim, one of the things you talked a little bit about is the importance of preparing. Um, we all know the importance of a good PCS purge to clean out your closets before moving day. What do you tell customers to purge before PCSing? I mean, you got to go through kind of everything. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it's, you know, you've moved in and I'm fortunate. I kind of uh, am a minimalist, so I don't have a lot to purge in my home. We kind of are on an ongoing purge. Uh, but go through those closets, things that people don't wear, things that are you've outgrown or you're never going to wear again, things you aren't going to use. Go through your books. If you have school books that you know aren't going to be used again, get rid of them. Do whatever you can to, to help lower that weight. That's going to be good for you to make sure that you don't go over your, go over your entitlement. 
Awesome. Very, very helpful. Thank you. All right, Sherelle. Uh -oh. Get ready. All right, Lizanne, you want to take us through rapid fire? Sure. We are going to put Sherelle in the hot seat, guys. And we have oh, a boy. whole list of those unusual PCS items that you just don't know what to do with when you're moving. And so we brought him on to just tell us what to do. So I'm going to start off with weight equipment because okay. we get lots of questions about Pelotons, treadmills, ellipticals, weight bench. Sherelle, tell us what to do with our weight equipment before and during a PCS move. Okay. Depending on who it's booked through, sometimes third parties set up, sometimes it's the service members that has to service that. If they wait to the low day when we're there and we're trying to get everything out, it can be it can be a mess because a lot of times we're done and we're still waiting around. There's no offense to them because I know, you know, not, not everyone's an expert with assembly and disassembly, but th that can delay us getting out of there. Um, and then they feel rushed sometimes, maybe not label parts as they should be. So I always recommend if you can uh, a few days ahead of time, even a week ahead of time, some items like bow flex machines, things like that, they will not come up. So if they're in a basement or even upstairs possibly, but yeah, they could take those apart ahead of time um, and not even strip down to the bare bones, just enough where that piece can come out of a room or go up a staircase, something like that. Awesome. Got it. Very and what do you mean by a third party? Who would I hire to take care of that before the movers come into the house? Uh, th that will be handled through the uh, booker. For example, Sudduth is a big booker in the United System. A lot of their military orders come with a third party service. So before we get there, the wash and dryer is already serviced. The weight equipment's already serviced. Mm -hmm. Some crates already done. I've also done moves where, like I said, it's, it's service members are on their own and I've helped assist it before because a lot of times they're like, oh, what I do? How, how do I cap a gas dryer? Yeah. I've been there Googling and, <laughs> for, so thank and in you. cases like that, we're technically not supposed to do it ourselves, but I mean, it takes no time. I'll sit there and help and, you know, walk you guys through it. It's not a big deal. All right. One of the questions we get asked most frequently, especially for folks who are coming back from somewhere fun like Italy, what about alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> That's up to the driver. As long as the alcohol is listed, on inventory slash manifest it's legal some drivers just don't want to bother with it some warehouses don't want to bother with it if i'm going a to b which is from origin your place of residence directly to your place of residence i take it like i said i'm, I'm greedy i like we get paid by weight i want the weight <laughs> give me the alcohol i'll take it okay Awesome. That is interesting. I did not know that you were reimbursed based on the weight. I know that we are as the military family, but I didn't know it impacted the driver. Well, we get, well, I'm an owner operator and we get paid a commission. So we get paid by weight and distance. Good to know. All right. Well, Tessa opened the door for uh, that food category. So I'm just <laughs> going to jump right in because I know our viewers have a ton of questions. And I understand this can maybe vary depending what your moving company is or what the movers in your house are actually telling you. So sometimes people get conflicting advice, mm -hmm. but let's start off with spices. I have a whole cabinet full of different spices. Some of them are half full. Some of them are old. Just tell me what to do with my spices. Let the packers take them or the All driver right. spices for the most part and no problem whatsoever uh, a good packer will look at the container and make sure you know it's it's secure the, the lids on tight uh when they're in the boxes we, we load them upright and a lot of times we'll draw arrows to make sure when it's being loaded or going into a warehouse that that box stays upright spices are not an issue i like that so making and sure spices that are a good thing to purge too right i mean go through your spices and get rid of the old ones they're not as good in your food now either. Yeah, what about overseas? Can spices go Oconus? That's a Tim call. Yeah, I, I, as far as I know, yeah. I'm, somebody's going to tell me I'm wrong, which would not surprise <laughs> me at all. It's kind of farther away from, from that level of detail than I used to be. But, uh, but there shouldn't be any problem with anything like that. I will say, maybe illegally, I packed spices in a Rubbermaid container from Guam, and they made it back to the United States. So oh. maybe you're not supposed to do that, but I wanted my spices to come back. There's a good, there's a good time to purge those too. I think right. I saw some 
you know, oregano from the nineties. This right. yeah. is still in at this point. <laughs> Not too delicious <laughs> anymore. <laughs> How often do you really use smoked paprika? I mean, let's be honest. Uh, what about canned food? Same. Um, a good packer will check the uh, integrity of the uh, the can, make sure it's not dented or anything like that. And if not, it's good to go. We'll pack them upright. Okay. And of course, label the boxes canned goods or liquids even. Mm. So about those liquids, because I know we've <laughs> all had some different experiences. Yes. I've had some movers that were so particular that they would not even pack my sealed prescription contact lenses because there's a few drops of liquid in each one of those contact lens containers. So they said, nope, it's liquid, can't do it. And then I've definitely heard stories of other people having like a whole open container of olive oil dumped all over their things or candles melting everywhere. So what is the regulation supposed to be with liquids and how can we be prepared and set ourselves up for success that way? That's really a, a, a case per case situation. Uh, if if I'm packing you and delivering, it's a one-stop shop for me. So I can address that. If a separate crew is going to pack you, a lot of times they, they, they won't take any liquids. So that's just to protect themselves too. They don't want that liability. Ah, oh, that makes sense. But a lot of drivers who pack and load, they, they'll make some kind of accommodation usually, unless it's um, aerosols, um, something that's really hazardous. Those right. we won't bother with. Yeah, and, and part of it is knowing what you're doing with your move. If you're going mm -hmm. direct to residence, they, and like you said, Sherelle, you know, they, you know, you're going to be in custody of the shipment until it gets to the customer. That's one thing. And then if you're moving and you know you're going to be in storage, if you're going temporary duty somewhere else for a while, that should help inform you on things that you don't want to send because those are your items. You don't want to get them ruined either. Mm hmm. That makes sense. And that probably explains why people get different answers to that yes. question, depending yes. on their move. Now, I saw when you were talking a moment ago about the dry goods like spices and canned food, Ernie's reminding us that flour and cereals are different. Why are there different rules for those? Is it because they explode and make a mess? I just still, I think that's still a case by case. I, I take them. Again, if I'm going direct, if it's going to warehouse, you know, those are perishable goods, they're going to be stale, they're going to be worthless. <laughs> mm. But if it's a quick move, if I'm going to deliver you in three or four days, five days, I'll, I'll, I'll take them. Um, like I said, it's, it's, it's going to be less of an issue for you at the other end trying to recoup those things or, you know, go buy five more boxes of cereal. But if it's going to warehouse, it's best just not to bother. I think we all are going to request that you move us. <laughs> um, talk to us about belly boxes. What are they? Where is it? Um, okay. Tell us about it. Some trailers have these um, undercarriage storage compartments, which yeah. in the moving, there you go right there. In oh, the no. moving industry, we call, we call them belly boxes. Is it flashing for you guys? Yeah, it's flashing. Yeah. I'm sorry. Hold on. Strobe light <laughs> belly boxes. My bad. <laughs> Let me try one more time. It's a belly belly sure box. Well, I feel like I'm in a club. There you go. All right. There we go. Okay. So not all trailers have them. Uh, I would say a large percentage of them do. Uh, so usually on the passenger side, that's reserved for the long ramps or the walk boards, as we call them. A lot of drivers will keep their driver's side belly boxes empty. I specifically will use that for... Um, Let's say oils, uh, bleach, uh, things like that, that a lot of drivers won't take at all. Mm -hmm. If you're going direct, it's not a big deal for me. I'll pack them. I'll put them underneath there. That way, for some strange reason, if one opens up or cracks or something, it's, it's going to damage my plywood or my, my snow chains. I mean, that's no big deal. And again, that's going to save you time on the other end having to go out and, and buy some of those things all over again. And, and, and that's also a case by case basis. Not all drivers are going to want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, if you can find out uh, if you've been assigned a driver yet, you can ask your coordinator, hey, you know, could you reach out? Uh, will it be OK if the driver put some items in his belly boxes? I love that because I had not heard that term until today. And <laughs> I'm glad to know I wasn't the only one. Jen says it's news to her, too. But that's really cool to know that that's something you can at least ask about ahead of time and know if there is an option because we all know it is so expensive. to. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
it really every is. cleaning product, every mm -hmm. liquid item in your pantry. I mean, I have a large family and it's hundreds of dollars just trying to replace those items. And that's where I store mine. Um, I have, you know, cleaning uh, stuff for the truck for my tractor or uh, extra bottles of oil, things like that. I put them in the belly boxes. I don't have any problems. Even going through mountains, no problems with them, you know, exploding or anything like that. So yeah, it's, a, it's an option. And I just can't help myself but to say that the belly box is the most ticklish part of the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> he is on a roll today. Yeah, he's here all day. <laughs> I really, once you said that the joke was cheesy, I can't oh, help he... <laughs> let us move on. But I didn't, I still snuck it in there right now. All right, let us move on to the next thing. What about, um, we've talked about liquids. We've mm -hmm. talked about food and um, exercise equipment. Talk to us about plants. Some people, their plants are their babies. How do you feel about that? Yes. Um, <laughs> I think I'm an aberration. I take them within reason. I will tell my my, my customers, uh, depending on the season, summer or uh, dead of winter, um, I, I don't water plants. <laughs> mm -hmm. If I have the space, I will take them, but there's a chance they could die. Um, a few plants, I, I will take, no problem. I'll, I'll pack them in boxes. And I'll ask them if they want to, you know, put a little water in beforehand. But they're they're hard to load with. That's why a lot of drivers don't like them, especially big trees. You you can't stack anything on top of them, obviously. Right. So you have to have to try and build around them or find a little nook and cranny to uh, load them. But um, other yeah, than that, and, and from our standpoint as a as a carrier, we'd say no to plants, right? Live plants. And again, kind of goes back to what Cheryl says too, is that you know we can't care for them while they're on the trailer. It's going to be hot. It's going to be cold. Mm -hmm. We can't water them. And yes, they would be really hard to, to load on a trailer. So, and depending on the state, if you're moving to California or Florida, it's mm -hmm. that's a no no. Yeah. <laughs> they do that's not what like. I was just wondering. Uh -huh. I thought there were certain states where agricultural yes. imports of yes. any type were really yes. restricted. Right. Yep. I wouldn't even bother taking an apple into those states. <laughs> Got it. So that's kind of on the driver to know the regulation, yes. to mm -hmm. know the state law. Sure is. Mm -hmm. And we really shouldn't be surprised if a driver just defaults to telling us no. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Got it. Um, well, let's talk about other dangerous things that shouldn't cross state lines. And that would be propane tanks. Or, um, you know, we do some camping and we have those little mini fuel containers. So I know that's all flammable. It's all explosive. Is there anything in that category that is allowed? And if there's not, then what are we supposed to do with those things before we move? find friends or neighbors, give them away. <laughs> yeah, have a big cookout at your house. Okay. And then you can purge all those spices on the food, so. You're right. <laughs> Years ago, we used to take them that they had a certificate saying they were purged, but now United just, we, their policy is we don't take them at all unless they're brand new and have never been used. Yeah, the DOD has changed their policy on that a few times over the years. It, what it was, they were prohibited, then they were allowed with a purge, and then they became prohibited again. I think that's where we are now. Is that okay, so current DOD regulations, anything propane-related is mm -hmm. not allowed. Correct. Yes. Yeah. All right, good. What about antiques? Uh, Tim? <laughs> What's an antique? <laughs> it, that's why I asked, yep. Right. So it's a, that's kind of one of those that's different for everybody. And there are some legal, I guess, definitions of what uh -huh. really is an antique. Um, so I think if you have something that you feel that it's an antique as a, as a consumer, one of the best things you can do, and this goes back to preparing for your move, is to document what you have before we ever come in and see it and or touch it, pack it, transport it, deliver it. Um, so the documentation is super important. So that could be you know, we're, there's, we're going on the, in, in the industry is to go through and have um, uh, electronic inventories, right? So that's helping us document things. So it's, uh, it's about the documentation. I saw the comment come up from Fred that said, you must have a certificate of, you know, authenticity or that it's been, uh, that it is an antique. Uh, there are all sorts of those kinds of things out there, but yeah, document what you have before, before we take possession of it. That's the best thing you can do to help protect yourself. And as a driver, we're taught to not even recognize that term. We, we can't even use that on our inventories. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So my grandma's china does not automatically become an antique. No, no. Just because yeah. it's old, it's not an antique. Uh -huh. That's Got it. All right. That's fair. All right. Then let's talk about what to do with our electronics. 
every family has some and let's try and cover the gamut of TVs, um, all those PlayStation and Xbox consoles, and then including all the, the DVDs and the games and everything electronic that goes into them. Anything we need to do ahead of time or that we need to know about packing those items? Uh, packing them, not an issue. Uh, if you have a really nice home theater system or a nice component set, we recommend that you mark or label or remove all the wires and cables and cords yourself because when we pack them, we basically just pull them out. <laughs> we, we don't label like this input goes to here, the DVR goes to there. We don't do that. So um, it'll definitely benefit the service member if they were That's to do that themselves. Take your pictures of, the, of yes. those items, right? Mm -hmm. That's another way to document it. Yep. Take a picture of those kinds of things. Okay. What about large items like your desk, sofas, chairs? How do I protect those? Um, a, a really good mover should be able to do that for you. Okay. Items like that. Um, well, that's the service that you're paying that the government yes, is paying us for. Yes, that's right? that's I what mean, we do. Mm -hmm. You know, the the pad wrapped uh, band service that Shrell and other drivers offer is the is the gold standard. Uh, from moving. So they're going to come in and they're going to wrap up all your stuff in nice furniture pads and, and make it safe before it ever comes out of the home. So, mm -hmm. um, so we should be protecting those for you. Yes. You shouldn't have to really do anything to prep those. All right. What about like sectionals and large sofas that come apart? Should we do anything to disassemble in advance? Should we be taking off the feet or the arms or anything like that? We'll, we'll, we'll do all that. Um, if, if, all if it's over. If it's fabric or upholstery, a really good crew should use a stretch wrap or stretch film to protect it. If it's leather, they'll use either paper pads or regular pads first and then go around it with the stretch fat or stretch wrap. Okay. And that should be done within a house too. I mean, on occasion, if something's really difficult to get out, they might stretch wrap it in the driveway. But for the most part, that gets all wrapped up inside residence. Yeah. What about paintings or large photography? Uh, paintings, if it's oil, there's a certain, um, uh, there's something called glassine that we use so that it doesn't stick. It's almost like wax paper and it won't stick to oil. Other than that, we just use regular brown, um, brown paper pads. And then we use, uh, mirror cartons for them. Okay. So we don't need to do anything to prepare nope. those. Nope. Okay. No. Depending and can you where they are, multiple are paintings in one box, or is it supposed to be a separate box for each glass? frame it's it's possible yeah, it, it depends on the thickness yeah it's not a requirement like it's you said it's not a requirement to use a separate box but it would be smart to use a separate box i wouldn't put two paintings in one box just because you're asking for potential claims from that okay. that makes sense i saw we had uh, a couple of questions pop up about exercise equipment and I just wanted to let Stacy and Jenna know we already talked about that. So go ahead and rewatch this later. Check out uh, Sherelle covered the weights. He covered Pelotons, um, getting a third party to disassemble those items. So one of the other things too on the paintings, just to add into that back on that is the idea of like, if you're our customer and you're prepping those and packing those, when we come in, we're going to repack them. We're going to open them up and inspect them and repack them. So let, I mean, I think it's in your own best interest to kind of let us do the work in that. Uh, it saves you the work and we need to do it anyway. We need to confirm what's in there. We need to confirm mm -hmm. that it's packed in an okay way. So, uh, you know, again, you've hired us to, the, the government's hired us to do the service on your behalf. Uh, that's the service that they're paying for. So, you know, don't do that extra work if you don't have to. That makes sense. Here's a good one from the audience. What about snow globes? <laughs> uh, if you, fuse, my house gets me rare snow globes each Christmas. If you can, depending on the time of year, you might want to take them yourself. Uh, I've had them freeze before and, and break, wow. unfortunately. Okay. I yeah, the, trailers aren't, the trailers aren't, uh, you know, temperature controlled, climate controlled. So it's going to be the actual temperature on that trailer. And if you have a snow globe and that water freezes in there, it's going to expand and break that glass. It and, sure uh, will. Mm -hmm. The absolute recommendation would be to take those on your own if you can. I didn't think, think about, about it freezing. I, I was thinking as long as it was bubble wrapped and it was yeah. 
gradually, nope. it would be temperatures. Fine, mm -hmm. The more you know. <laughs> right. It, it's ironic that the snow globe can't handle the cold. <laughs> oh, we got lots of jokes. Now, we do sometimes get viewers who talk about having multiple colors of PCS stickers on their boxes. Half their boxes are red and the other half are yellow. Tell us what that means and is there anything that we need to be keeping track of if we notice different colored PCS stickers? Well, oh, yeah, got, it just threw me under the bus. You see that? <laughs> Um, so I, on that, I think that if, if it's a mover that has been hired for you, um, it's our responsibility to provide you with new packing material. There should not be stickers on those boxes that the government's paying for that. If you're doing your own PPM move and you have multiple stickers and that, or you've done it in the past, or you have boxes that have other stickers on it, on there, get rid of them before your new mover comes in that the government's hired to. Put the new sticker on oh there. so that's if the stickers are left over from a previous move. Right, right. is there are there times when they would use multiple colors all at once within one day like renee is saying for example here that they used a different color for indoor and outdoor items it's possible mm -hmm. yeah Sherelle, we but thought the, you just didn't want to answer that question. No, no, I, I hit the wrong, I hit the wrong button, and bam, I was out. <laughs> Tim was like, oh, I guess I'll take that. <laughs> Welcome Tim's back. doing a good job, though. Like, nice, nice backup, Tim. Thank you. Um, and I think, I think we yes, just we have another question here from mm -hmm. Marion, um, which we haven't discussed yet. So thank you for bringing this up. What do we do if we notice that there's been some type of damage from the moving company throughout the process that can be damage to the interior of the home, things being scratched, paint being chipped. It could be damage outside if something got dropped on the sidewalk or dug up the lawn. What's the process for handling that? A lot of us carry a, um, quality control forms. So at the end of the move, we'll go through, we'll do a walk around with the shipper. Uh, we'll, we'll note anything. If it's something minor and if I think that I can handle it or get someone to cover it, I'll, I'll say, hey, you know, can I take care of this? If not, uh, we have a claims adjuster who will take care of that. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, it's sometimes drivers do have that ability to do minor repairs and if the customer's OK with that. That's that's fine. Um, and then we are responsible for make, making sure that your home is in the same condition. At, 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 at the time we're done as it was when we got there. Uh, so you can contact your carrier, your, your TSP, uh, your move management company, however you want to refer to them. But uh, the carrier that's been hired will be responsible for making sure that your home's uh, put back to order. Got it. And Tim, from the DOD regulations, is there a time limit to how long I have to report any type of damage or is there any um, you yeah, know, the, minimum or maximum. The time limit right. now is 180 days, and then there's nine months to file a claim. So oh, wow. You know, any kind yeah. Of 180 days from delivery. Um, we would expect if there was damage at, at origin residence, at the pickup residence, you know, that that would be disclosed to us well before that time. Um, but we can usually get folks out to do any kind of repairs or work with, you know, the the leasing company and the apartment company or whoever it is, you know, has responsibility for, for the premises. We're, we're happy to get involved with them. And that's usually the way those things get resolved. That's really helpful. I think on our list of what should we do with, I think mean, the last one is maybe pets. Obviously we know, you know, how to get our dogs from point A to point B, but can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of making sure that those dogs are secured on moving day and our, what to do with our other pets while we're physically moving? Um, I've, I know a lot of uh, my customers, they'll have them um, in a certain designated area, like maybe, okay, the guest bedroom, no one goes in there, especially cats, because cats can dart out in a heartbeat um, or in a backyard or something. Um, and, and it's more not that the guys are unfriendly it's just we, we don't want to hurt your pet if we're walking around with a dresser or carrying boxes you know an animal can easily go you know walk between our legs or something so it's more for them their protection but uh friendly pets most crews you know we uh we get distracted <laughs> playing with the puppies so <laughs> well that's good and we had a question here from courtney uh nail polish is one of those items that 
Some people consider it to be liquid. Some people yes. don't. I guess it could be flammable. Is there an official DOD regulation on whether or not nail polish should be packed? We're told we're not we're not supposed to take them. <laughs> and I don't know I don't know if that's through DOD or if that's through United, but I know we're not supposed to take nail polish. Got yeah, it. I don't know if the DOD. I can't remember if the DOD yeah. has that in their regulations or Me not. Neither. There's, you know, there's hundreds of pages. For those of you that don't know, there are literally hundreds of pages of the DOD regulations. And at one time, I had read them all, um, <laughs> but they change them frequently, and there are hundreds of new pages out there, and a lot of things have changed. So I don't recall whether that's specifically in there or not, but I know that's a the policy we want to follow is to not take those. Cheryl, I, I want to know, yes. what's the most bizarre thing you've been asked to pack <laughs> for our, our very family-friendly PG audience? Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. I don't know if this was actually true or not, but um, I, I moved a geologist, man, late 90s in Ohio. And he said these, he had these poison tip steer, spears from the Amazon. And I thought he was joking. He goes, no, they really are. I'm going, no, you're joking. He goes, no, these are really poison tip spears. And I said, well, we, we can't touch these then. He's like, well, why not? I said, you just you just told me what they are. You just divulged that information. Like, no, I don't want me or my guys touching them. So <clears throat> and he got mad, but he did it himself. <laughs> that wasn't a military move. That was a COD. That was a personal cash okay. and delivery move. But yeah, that's that probably the weirdest. Question, what, about, uh, what about weapons? I mean, if somebody has a bow and arrow collection or you know a Glock, what do you... <laughs> What or they ammo. I think we did have a, a comment mentioning ammo. So is that something? We're, that we we're not allowed to take ammo. No. Okay. Um, I know, I think, I, I can't remember numbers offhand, but there's. I know there's a certain amount, uh, if you take it, you actually have to have a hazmat, uh, hazardous material uh, endorsement. But we just don't bother. Weapons, we will. We will make sure that they're empty in the presence of the owner. Hmm. Uh, serial numbers, model number, that's all taken, and then they're packed, noted, and usually when it's loaded, a, a smart driver will not load weapons on a door. They're always in the interior of the load. That way, if knock on wood, it doesn't happen with a truck where to get broken into, yeah. guns aren't just sitting right there at the door at the ready. Right, and you don't want to label your boxes as yes. guns. Yes, yes. Right? Label mm -hmm. them as weapons. I think the phrase yep. sporting goods is... Exactly. I mislabel them too. And actually even going back to alcohol, I'll mislabel alcohol sometimes too. I'll just put liquids. I won't put alcohol because some people have expensive whiskey or bourbon or something. So That is true. Um, and when we were talking about different types of plants that we, we've said that some states had different rules. I missed mm -hmm. this question from Julie. She said, what about seeds? Mm -hmm. Do you know if we're able to transport seeds in a move with those state regulations? If they're not open, I do take them. Um, again, with California and Florida, I just wouldn't bother personally. That's just me. And then that could potentially hold up your shipment too. I've seen shipments going to quarantine in California before and it sat oh, wow. for weeks. Oof. Yeah, you're better served than not. I mean, mm -hmm. again, if they're in a package and it's not been opened, I think that would probably be okay. But if it's something that you're you know, preparing or that you've taken the seeds from, like, from plants in your garden and you have seeds that are going to plant next year, I would recommend not taking those, not shipping those, take those on your own. Sure. Good to know. Okay. Here's one from Julie Ann, very specific, um, but a really important question. Can you move an urn of a family member with ashes inside? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything you recommend doing to prep that, like making sure that it's wrapped tightly uh, or something? We can accommodate that. I, I don't know how they come. I don't know if they come in a certain container when they're, you know, given mm -hmm. to the families. And, but and we, we, yeah, that's one for us. I mean, you, you got to do what works for you. But my personal recommendation would be not to ship that, not to have that shipped, because you think about there's always some chance that something's going to go wrong, right? And, you know, that's just the way the world works, unfortunately. And there are things that are outside of our control that happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if it's truly an irreplaceable item, right, most of the things that we ship are, you know, they're replaceable items, books and couches and those kinds of things. 
But those kinds of things that are truly irreplaceable, I would recommend if you have the ability to not ever part with them, to keep them within your, you know, within your control, control what you can, right? Uh, so I would recommend not doing that. I think that we can move those, um, but I just think that that would be, if, if there's any way possible you can take it on your own, dude, I would recommend taking it on your own because that, so if you, if you think about it from a claim standpoint, right? We talked about what's an antique earlier, right? You know, mm -hmm. it's, you think it's an antique just because it's old and you have this high value on it, but legally the value on, you know, on grandma's plates might be $9, but it's, you know, to you it's priceless. And for something like a family member, again, that's something that's priceless. What are you going to get if there's a claim on that if it comes up missing? You're going to get probably reimbursed for the price of the urn, huh. right? And that's yeah, and that's True. not going to be anywhere near what you're suffering or your your feeling of loss would be. So I would I would recommend not shipping that. That's great advice. Thank you. I appreciate great. that. And I can uh, say, in my all my years, I've never ever hauled one to my knowledge. <laughs> okay. Never. Here's another audience question for you. What about taxidermy? Taxidermy. So those stuffed little squirrels and yeah. lion heads and <laughs> hopefully not lion heads. <laughs> Where are you getting these? <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. Those are usually created actually. Okay. In my experience, they're usually created. And if the uh, government won't take care of it, I know I've had service members pay themselves to get it done. Yeah, frequently we move those. It's very common to move that kind of stuff, and it is the best practice is to have those items created so that they're suspended within a container mm -hmm. as opposed to being packed. It's a better um, uh, opportunity to, to prevent damage that way. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up Christopher's question here about um, any type of collection. He mentioned shoe collections and jewelry and Legos. But I know that we've had viewers before just talking about clothing in general. You know, if I have a box that's just labeled clothes, it's probably only worth $50 in a claims process. But if that's full of designer jeans or some type of name brand, it could be $1,000 worth of clothing in that box. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle that? Uh, again, it kind of goes back to mislabeling for something like that, because uh, I've moved, you know, collections of uh yeah, like he said, Jordans, I just did one recently, or, you know, uh, handbags, uh, Louboutin shoes. Mm -hmm. You just put shoes or clothes on a box. On the actual inventory, though, I will know it exactly what's in that box. So if box number 13 just says shoes, it, it you don't want to go there, but we know nothing's, it's not a perfect world. You don't want to go into a warehouse and it says Air Jordans, you know, or 1997 Air Jordans. You just oh, put I shoes, see. but on actual inventories, I would write, you know, a pair from 1997 or whatever specific model that is, and we'll put high value on the paperwork to documentate that or document that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And it's, it's one of those things that for you as a customer, there's a requirement for us based on certain criteria to say what things are, are high value items. Um, but you're, as our customer, if you believe that you have something that's a high value item, which might be, you know, it's of extraordinary value, or you think that it's something that people would want to steal, like uh, Christopher Michaels, uh, Chris's uh, Air Jordans here, um, you want to document those, you want to make sure your mover is aware of them. And then the other part, let's go back to, I, I think I've said a couple times here, take a picture of those things before you move. Right? Mm -hmm. You've got it, you know, should get a picture of you in the frame with all your or with all your shoes because that's going to help you document the value so if you've got a bunch of really expensive jeans uh you know fancy purses those kinds of things make sure you have that documented because if it is a high value item and it's not noted uh prior to pickup and it does come up as a claim later you know they're, they're going to ask you to establish or document that you actually have ownership of that you know if you say i've got an eight thousand dollar purse that's not very common, right? So there should be some documentation that you have ownership of that. That'll help you when and if there's a claim. So is it the owner's responsibility to declare high value items or should the movers be doing some of that automatically? It's joint, right? So there are certain yeah. things that we, we need to declare that we know, but there are things that, you know, a collection that, you know, our guys aren't experts on, on purses, not most of them anyway, a few <laughs> of them might be, but, uh, 
but yeah, they don't know. So tell us. And if you think it's mm -hmm. high value, I think almost everybody's going to say, yeah, absolutely. We'll take care of it again because it's important to you. It should be important to us. And I really like that Sherelle clarified that sometimes the description used on the box is more generic than what's on the inventory sheet. And I've actually seen a lot of customers complain about that, saying, like, I can't believe the movers just labeled my expensive shoes as shoes when I told them 17 times that they were, you know, name brand and they were very valuable. And I never thought about that from the perspective <coughs> of it being for our own safety and to kind of yes. make that box a little bit less yes. conspicuous in a warehouse. So you're saying really yes. the important details are on the inventory sheet. Correct. Uh, summer can get crazy. Tim can tell you, uh, you might have three or four drivers loading at a warehouse on any given day, stuff sitting on a dock, dollies going back and forth. And yeah, you just don't want a box just kind of sitting there on the floor that says, uh, uh, hey, Jimmy Choo shoes, you know, or Louboutin shoes, just sitting there, coach bags. You, you don't right. want that. Right. Got it. All right. I'm scanning through our comments here. Um, Jennifer had a, a clarification. Just uh, Jennifer. Sure that... yeah. I know Jennifer Anderson. Excellent. Well, she wants to make sure that high value items are identified on the inventory. So that's what you were just talking about. Thank you. And guys, I'm going to do a quick scan for any more of your audience questions, but I think Tessa is getting ready for that wheel of names. So it's my favorite part of the show. <laughs> All right. So we're giving away two prizes today. So let me go ahead and share my screen, which if you've watched before, you know, feels like a Christmas miracle every single time it works. Here we go. Wheel of names. All right. The first prize is going to. There it goes. Maybe. Oh, Crystal Curtis. Okay. Prize one, Crystal Curtis. And prize two, spin it again. Is oh, it's thinking. Marion McKenzie. So, Crystal and Marion, if you would please make sure that you message the PCS Grades Facebook page so we can coordinate how to get you your prizes. Would really appreciate it. And I love this. Great show, so much great info. All of the all of the compliments for you too. You both have been just a wealth of knowledge. We're so grateful to have you on the show. Lizanne, do we have any follow up questions we need to address before we let these gentlemen get back to their day jobs? I didn't see any, but I do encourage you, especially those who are watching afterwards when it's not live, please continue to leave your questions because not only can we go back to these guys and ask them through email later to handle those difficult questions, but you always know that we can bring guests onto the show to answer the questions that you have. So we want to see your questions, even if it's after the fact, and we will do our best to answer them accurately. And I also want to invite you all back to the webinar next week. We are going to shift gears and focus on the month of the military child. And we're going to be talking about how sports can really help our military kids adjust after PCS moves. We, our special guest is going to be Amy of Tiny Troops Soccer. So that will be super fun for anyone that has kids and is preparing to move with them or has dealt with those older kids struggling with PCS moves. So thanks again to both Sherelle and Tim. You guys have been so helpful. And until next week, this too this shall be PCS. Yay. Thanks for having us.